This is the Gauntlet Podcast. My name is Lowell. I'm joined by my co-host, Sherry Stewart. Hi, Sherry. Hello. And we are joined for this episode by notable GM and player from the Gauntlet, Bethany Harvey. Hi. I'm delighted to be here. Excellent. Uh, We're glad to have you on. You know, you've been on for a little over a year on the Gauntlet, right? Yeah. Yeah. um, Uh, Almost exactly a year. I started February. Oh, awesome. So, listeners, this is our Hangouts Roundup, where we talk about games that we played in February, and uh, we're going to name what we did, and then talk about uh, one particular game. So, Sherry, tell us tell us about your February on the Gauntlet. So, in February, I played One Percenter, a hack for Super, so right now it's being called Super's One Percenter. Rich Rogers is working on it, and... Uh, that was we played that all through February. Played Cryptomancer, which is one of my faves. A little bit more of Hearts of Ulin. I can never get enough. And um, a Woodlands hack for Pokemon, which we had a few lovely, sweet little episodes of. Then off Gauntlet, I played Thirteenth Age. Played Urban Shadows. Played Trail of Cthulhu. Played Bat Hack, and we played um, a. More sessions of our homebrew OCI Masks of the Empire. So what are you going to talk about today? Uh, Today, I would like to talk about Super's One Percenter. Um, Essentially, this is a hack that Rich Rogers was working on on One Percenter. It is essentially a flyweight system to get Super's to the table. And it is very light. And the One Percenter system is kind of clever. It's got a little bit of dice trick, but not anything that slows you down. It has a bunch of fans among the gauntlet, and I can kind of see why. It really sort of just gets you in there, and you can get going. Essentially, you come in, you pick your concept, choose a couple of powers, pick the role that you want to have in the group, and then you set scores to a few stats, and you're set to go. The secret ingredient is called Spark, which you use that you can add to your own roles to give you a better chance on something, or you can add to one of your teammates' roles as well, so you get to share those resources around. But that spark also serves as your damage track as well. So, you know, there's just a little bit of having to think through what you're going to do here. Or you could be crazy and generous and then go down a lot. That's fun, too. I have to ask, is that the parallel to the one percenters mechanic of shit where you give a shit and take it all is that is that how rich redid it is that is that the term yes spark all right yes i assume so there is no and but yeah one percenters Um, is a a game of motorcycle gangs (laughs) yes yes so it comes from that thing but i i didn't get too much of a sense of that motor gate motorcycle gang um dna uh so that i guess that was good um i had never played the original system so for me, I was coming to it just through this, this system. So I may not speak that well to the original game, and I apologize. But what I liked about it was, that, this sounds horrible, but play lots of PBTA, and I love it, but there's a certain strain that goes, I don't know when I'm going to make a test, which is good and bad. I'm not worrying about it. But other times, sometimes when I make a test, I'm like, well, look, what did I do? <laughs> I didn't mean for that. <laughs> so. So what I like about this is that the dice come out for trad reasons. When you're doing something that you might fail, and that would be a problem. And it's very classic, like my lifetime of role playing. I I know when we're going to roll. So that was lovely for me. (laughs) Um, The fights are short. The powers are mostly fictional positioning, um, not dice dice tricks or advantages or any mechanical anything. They are there to go. I, I can do this because these are my abilities. And they fill in for that. But the thing that was really fun is that the spark, handing that around, using it sensibly, watching it get smacked down when you have a bad roll, that was super fun. And the best thing about it and what made the game kind of stand in the place that I like, which is it's got a little bit of tread, but it's also got enough of the story game where regenerating spark is all about these team interactions. So then you kind of do these close-ups or these small scenes, these character building scenes to regenerate your spark and get your energy back to keep on going. And that was a nice emotional piece to something that could have been just get into fights, then look for another fight than get into a fight. It wasn't like that at all because of that spark. Well, and the GM, of course, always the GM. <laughs> so the things that I was less sure about, if I, if I think about it, if I were to back up, 
the GM has to understand the superhero tropes themselves. There's nothing about the system that pushes you to certain kinds of interactions or certain types of drama. If the GM doesn't know those, if the players don't know them, they're not going to head to them on their own. So there's that that thing that you don't have the helpful guideposts of moves that PBTA gives you. The emotional play isn't baked in as much. Um, there are no things where someone else has a wrench that they can push you into an emotional situation. That is, it is all if you choose to or not. And some players are in that place where they want to do it, and some are less so. So there's a lot more room for people to figure out where they want to be on that. But there are no wrenches for other people to push your buttons. And if you love the crunch of powers and things like that, this is not going to be the system for you. Um, You have a fictional positioning. It's great fun because you could go, well, you know, I've got electrical power so I can weld them to, you know, the grate in the sidewalk, of course, you know, (laughs) whatever. (laughs) So it's that kind of thing. You've got all of that stuff. You've got that, that imaginative play, but you do not have extra dice or times when you have advantages or anything because of that. So if that sort of power or that problem solving that comes with having mechanics appeals to you, this may not be that system. Um, My takeaway, though, from it is if you want to get a supers game to the table, you want it to be fun. People can do their powers. They have that freedom. But you also want it to have that team feel. This is actually a really good little lightweight hack for it. I had a great time. And the GM was awesome. And a lot of people know those tropes. So I think a lot of people get to, to the table and enjoy it. Uh, so, Bethany, you have questions or comments about that? Okay, so this is not entirely relevant, and neither of you may know the answer to this, but where does the one percenter's name come from? I have no idea. Okay. It is a term that comes from, uh, like, one of the motorcycle gangs, like, uh, I can't remember exactly what it is, and people, people back at at home listening are going to be screaming <laughs> because they know this, but it is it is actually a term that comes from motorcycle gang culture okay and not as i originally assumed like something to do with the, the 99 that's what 1%, i was thinking i was like you know, was political this? revolution okay yeah what does this have to do with the super rich right. no nothing at all <laughs> yeah i i when rich first suggested this i that was a little odd for me too so now Bethy, have you done much superhero role playing I, what i found on the gauntlet is people are either neutral or positive or super opposed to supers gaming i'm pretty neutral i don't um, I don't seek out superhero games, but like if there's a GM that I know is really good and they happen to be running a superhero game, then I will jump into it. I've played in uh, Jim Crocker's uh, Monster of the Week game, which is, it's, I guess it's more, it's, a com- it's the Gauntlet Comics game. It's not really a superhero type game. Okay. And I've played the, what, what's the fate superheroes hack? Uh, Venture City Stories? That's it. Yeah, I've played that and that, and that was a lot of fun. I kind of like faint supers, but I'm a minority amongst the, the gauntleteers. And again, more people are screaming at me uh, uh, when I'm listening at home. Sherry, anything else you want to say about uh, this this hack? I would play it again. I know Rich was, was thinking of making a few changes, and I would definitely be in for taking another seat. I enjoy supers, and I liked the level of getting to goob on your powers and having like a real team feel to it. So that was a nice... It was a nice combo for me. Um, And mind you, I love masks, but masks is all about being a teenager first and then a supers next. And sometimes being a teenager is exhausting. (laughs) And for those of you at home, goob is a local Indiana dialect for exploiting the rules. Uh, Yes, I just wanted to get the the Hoosierism uh, that is is in there. Out of there. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Bethany, how was your February? I, so I've been completely spoiled with awesome game sessions the past couple months. I, I don't know when this streak is going to end, but I'm going to be very sad when it does. Uh, but uh, yeah, in February, Off Gauntlet, I played Stars Without Number, a couple sessions of Scout before that game sort of petered out, um, <laughs> and ran a little bit of Dungeon World. And on the Gauntlet, I played in a lot of Jim Crocker's uh, sessions, which, which is great because Jim is a wonderful GM and his games are just always amazing. I played in the Gauntlet Comics Monster of the Week, Jim's Trophy Incursion, and the Playtest of the Bat Hack. Mm. Then I also played in the uh, Monster Hearts or the Mercy Falls Ooh. Um, 58 
campaign and White Hack and uh, Dream of Skew, which is the one I'm going to talk about. All right. So, yeah, give us the, the preview. I don't think we've talked about Dream of Skew on the podcast, for, at least for a very long time. Oh, cool. Yeah. So I had uh, an amazing group of players for this. So some of this will probably be reflected by that. And I'm not sure how much the combined group of very good players who were very good together mm -hmm. contributed to this experience versus the mechanics of the game. But uh, I guess, what is it, right? It's a cooperative game, GM list, GM full, whatever you want to call it, but each player controls both like their main character and um, an element to the setting. Like you can be, uh, for Dream of Skew, it's like the earth and uh, the digital realm and gangs just things that you might bring in to cause trouble. So is that is that assigned during the character creation process, or is it more flexible? So that's that's a funny thing. It is it is assigned during the character creation process, but you can switch out. Okay. Like, especially if your character is going to interact with that setting out, you don't want to play both sides of that. So you just, like, put it down. What We ended up doing it even looser than that. Okay. You also have no dice. Oof. You you can gain and spend tokens rather than rolling dice. So you have a lot of each player has a lot of control over the narrative that way. Um, in fact, the I, I think the system is now called No Dice No Masters, <laughs> um, which I I love. There's been a lot of hacks of it right just coming out, uh, but it's Dream Askew itself is uh, the original one, um, and it's. I think it's I think it's just being shipped now. Uh -huh. It's uh, half of a book along with Dream Apart, and uh, they're both games uh, with the same system. Both are set in communities where you have like you're kind of cut off from the dominant culture, and you have kind of a hostile relationship with them. Mm. But uh, Dream Askew is you're in a post-apocalyptic queer enclave, where Dream Apart you're in a kind of 19th century-ish. Shtetl in Eastern Europe. Oh, yeah. So very, very different settings with the same system. Wow, that's that's kind of an amazing flip. I I didn't realize that was the other half of it. Yeah, and I've, uh, I've also played, or I've, I've just started a Flotsam campaign, which is loosely based on both uh, on that system, or at least has a lot in common with it. Mm, okay, it's a little. I almost. It's hard to call a story game crunchy, but right. it's a little crunchier. Oh, okay. You mean the token passing? Yeah, you know, the ways the ways you earn it are a little more formalized, I guess. Mm -hmm. So, so what what do you what did you dig about uh, Dream Askew? I actually really like the token system. It's very intuitive. You have a list of strong moves, regular moves, and weak moves. And if you make a weak move, you gain a token. And to make a strong move, you spend a token. It's very simple. You also gain a token by interacting with another player in a certain way. So it's a lot like a flag, but you're rather than choosing from this big long list of flags, mm -hmm. each playbook has one. Uh, the game calls it a lure instead of a flag. There are examples like um, ask me to fix something or pretend my riddles. Mine was give me a chance to prove myself. They gave us just immediate things to do. It's right there. It's like do this um, to earn a token. And uh, it helped us get past that whole awkward oh we just did character and word creation we have to start the story now where do we start i've experienced that a lot with story games it was a very short mm -hmm. very short phase uh for this um we did very little fumbling around just started playing so those those lures are a really great tool nice do you think that's adaptable elsewhere yeah i think i think anything where you have to frame a scene I, that, that jumping back and forth between like high and low level storytelling, I guess. I have a hard time with that mm -hmm. that shift into like scene. Yeah. So I, I like having a real concrete direction. I think it's very handy. And I would absolutely port it to any story game I could. Yeah, that's a really good idea. You're always thinking about things. Yes, I am. I'm going to steal always. from everything eventually. So, <laughs> so what else uh, worked for you? I had played both Dream Askew and Dream Apart um, before, but only in one shots. And uh, I'd always sort of wondered like what it would be like to have mm -hmm. some more time and some more room to breathe. So I put a three session campaign on the calendar, and it worked really well as a three session. It was a perfectly decent game to start with. Mm. We, like I said, there was very little fumbling around. But uh, the second session, we got about halfway through and we took a break and we came back. 
And all of a sudden, our, you know, perfectly decent game had turned into this amazing post-apocalyptic soap opera. Oh, good. <laughs> like, all of the different threads came together, and we had siblings leading rival gangs. Um, we had uh, characters just making these, like, horrible bargains left and right. All of the different paths crossed and, like, got tied together. It was great. Wow, that's super. Also, like, just the playbooks. The question seemed very simple. And also, they, they seem very limiting at first. Like, you're, mm -hmm. you look at it and you're like, oh, I am definitely supposed to play this particular archetype. But I think we ended up with very um, individual characters that we, we all ended up with, honestly, the nicest possible version of these characters. <laughs> <laughs> and I was a little worried that we wouldn't cause enough trouble for each other. Like, the, the potential for drama is higher if, you know... <laughs> Um, your characters are not evil, but at least neutral. But um, no, even with all good characters, we had plenty of drama. Mm -hmm. And the answers to the questions turned out to be very consequential. They just drove the whole story. Awesome. You've talked very positively about this. Anything else positive you want to mention before I, I ask you what the flip side is? <laughs> Um, no, no, I, I, I'm sure there, like, I could talk, um, a lot about the positive stuff, but there, there were some confusing and just strange choices, I think, for the negative side, which one of them is the regular moves. They're just kind of there. You don't, they have no mechanical effect. There's just this list of regular moves between weak moves and strong moves, and you can just completely ignore them. They're just like suggestions on things you might do. Okay. And I think they could still be there, but be called something else. And that would be more useful. Mm -hmm. I ended up just ignoring them. and th But then I looked back at them at the end and I realized I had used about half of my weak moves, none of my strong moves, and every single one of my regular moves without ever looking at them. So they're good suggestions. Oh. <laughs> uh, I just I think they should be called something other than moves and placed somewhere other than in between strong and weak moves. Mm -hmm. Well, we do have that sense of moves being a mechanical thing. So, I mean, with that tradition, so that makes sense. But if you look at all of those things as right. just being suggestions. Some of them have a positive price, some of them have a negative price, have price, but these just have no, you don't earn anything, you don't yeah. spend anything. Yeah, I, my, my, really, my only complaint about them is that they're called moves, really. Mm. Uh, <laughs> there's also a little confusion about the, the setting elements. You, you claim one at the start, and say I claimed the earth, and then my character wanders out into the wilderness, I need to drop the earth and hand it to somebody else and pick up a different one, right? <laughs> we each claimed one at first, but eventually they just sort of ended up this pool that you, you know, anybody who could pick from whenever that something occurred to them. And there was actually one point near the end where all but one character were in a scene together. And... The remaining player took all of the setting elements. And so we, we just, somebody noticed, hey, we have a GM now. <laughs> it worked fine. In fact, I think Sarah may have orchestrated it to be the GM yeah. for that scene. Because <laughs> she did have a lot of plot ideas in the background. So it worked great. She did a great job. Uh, but I think I can see a player finding himself in that position and getting stressed out about it. Like, oh, because I'm the only one not in the scene, I am responsible for the world. Mm. And, you know, players don't necessarily go into a game prepared to be the GM. You know, those are those are minor things that we worked around pretty easily. So uh, I don't really have any big major system breaking complaints or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Uh, Sherry, you have questions? I know that we had some of the sort of uh, claiming elements in, was it Questlandia? Was the game that we played? The... Questlandia. Yeah, exactly. Gosh, why couldn't I think of that name? Um, and... How did they define like what you do with those elements then? Is it like whenever the character runs into them or is interacting with those that you decide what the outcome is? So the elements almost have their own playbook mm. with a list of, well, the elements have a list of regular moves <laughs> um, because you don't have to, you don't have to spend anything or earn anything. You, you don't deal with tokens at all as a setting element. You do, you make a choice of what that setting element wants, which is a little kind of an odd phrase when you're talking about the earth, but it's basically the things that that 
setting element is going to demand of characters either literally or metaphorically Mm -hmm. and then you have this list of like possible moves they're almost like gm moves in dungeon world or apocalypse world okay that makes complete sense (laughs) so (laughs) that's awesome and that is a little bit more structure than what i'm used to so that that seems a little less trepidatious than i was feeling about it yeah i think it would be great if someone wants to like try gming Oh yeah. This would be a, this would be a very good introduction to that like okay, you're GMing one element of the setting here. Oh, that's really clever. So any any last thoughts anything else you want to say about Dream Askew? Okay, in my experience it does not make a good one shot. The book presents it as a one shot. The character creation takes a long time and Oh. There's a lot of questions between characters and then you also have to sort of create the world and answer these questions about the setting element that you're playing. Mm-hmm. So you know, it takes a good hour and a half to two hours at least for online play which is you know a little slower but because of that you only get maybe an hour to play Mm -hmm. and that takes you through two or three scenes which is not enough to develop a story i i have no idea how you're supposed to maybe we're doing something wrong Mm. (laughs) i have no idea how you're supposed to play that in one session three sessions worked pretty well for us uh we didn't really our stride until the, the second half of the second session that so was almost five hours into the game. <laughs> but three sessions, we got we got in some satisfying arcs. We still had a big cliffhanger ending. And in fact, uh, there will be a sequel that's up on the Gauntlet calendar right now. Oh. <laughs> One other thing is that the players have so much narrative control because there's no dice roll at all. You have to get people who are willing to play to lose um, or to like cause trouble for themselves and not try to win. <laughs> Not try, um, even though, you know, if you're in a scene, another player is likely to be playing a set, setting element or another player is working against you, mm-hmm. you're still, you can just spend a token and say, oh, I have this very powerful, strong move that will get me out of this situation. Yeah, I, w- I would not play it with, or I'd be cautious about playing it with people who've only played Pathfinder. Yeah, you know, Sherry and I were actually talking about that this week is, uh, we played with some people who have been kind of defensive in their reactions. Like, like pa- if people are defensive and protective of their things, PBTA can often kind of slow down because they don't want them to 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 go for the drama that they they kind of hold on to things. Yeah, this is a step further along that path where you you just you you have to embrace problems. Oh yeah, and that is a continuum. I mean, it takes. It takes a while to learn to do that if you've come from Pathfinder or D&D or, I mean, any of the play-to-win games. I mean, certainly it was over years that our face-to-faces come closer that it's taken. I mean, now they're, they could probably handle those games. They play PBTA just fine. I write a lot of fiction. I think that helps with the knowing that drama comes from having problems to overcome and from occasionally just failing. Mm. But if you're expecting your GM to be like your antagonist and you're constantly trying to beat the whatever the GM has planned, you kind of get into that mindset. Where, oh, I'm, I have to win. I have to win. And then you get hit with a game like this where all of all of the problems your character faces, you or the other players are creating. And it's, I think it's a I think there's definitely a, a mental shift that has to take place there for it to work. Mm-hmm. Well, I want to talk about my February. I go last. Uh, here uh, off gauntlet played 13th age urban shadows we did our ocean city interface game we did trailer casulu and we played rich rogers bat hack tried that i don't know baseball like at all i discovered and uh, so that's been a, a really eye-opening for me uh, but then on gauntlet it did hilt blade been running masks and new generation our quarterly of that i did forbidden lands which i talked about in the the last show uh, also did Session of Microscope. And then I did Cryptomancer, which is what I want to talk about. So Cryptomancer is a fantasy game about magical hacking. That's how it's advertised. Uh, that's how it's presented. It's, it's classic elves, dwarves, humans, those kinds of people. But it's not a net running game. It's not like Shadowrun or anything like that. Instead, it's about information security. And everything spins from, from that concept. Which, when I first picked it up, because it had a pretty cover, I'm going to admit, uh, I was shocked when I read it because I was like, wait, this isn't what I was expecting. But I, I ran it and I really liked it. And I ran it again uh, in February and 
I kind of got it this time. Like I liked it before, but now I really, really love it. It's got a unique system mechanically. It has dice pools and skills, but it's still, I would say, more of a, an indie game. What I really like about this, what I really, 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 really like, love about it is it builds on a couple of key setting premises that it sets up and everything else spins out from there. It's a fantasy world which has two very key developments. One is that anybody can encrypt any communication. Like that's a, everybody can do it. It's just a natural thing. And you encrypt that with a passphrase. And if someone has ever heard that passphrase, when you speak to them, they, they pick up that message. They can understand it. They can decode it. And people also have a, like a soul key that is really private and held. And you can use that to have absolutely trusted communications between people. So we've got this, everybody can encrypt. And the other thing is the existence of these things called shards, which are kind of a portable fantasy communication system. So there's one big shard, you split it up into pieces, and anybody can hold a shard and communicate with another person who's holding the shard. And there's there's sort of a shard space that goes on. And there's actually the equivalent of the internet in that there's one massive shard that has pieces in every city. And everything spins out from there. Uh, the magic is all related to it. What you're trying to do is all, all uh, considering it. You know, who has the passcodes, how you do these things, and it how the world works, what's happening in it, all plays out from, from that. And it is so good. It is so smartly built. It is so clever. It, it goes in interesting and novel directions with the elves and the dwarves and how the world is set up. Last time on, on the show, I talked about Forbidden Lands, and the, my big problem with it was that it, that it had set up some key premises about the setting and didn't follow through. Like, it the, made no sense. It was no logic. This is the exact opposite, and it's so cool. It's a game that's about problem solving, and I love problem solving games. I love a game that says, okay, you need to do this thing. How are you going to do it? You know, I like mysteries. I love mystery games, uh, unlike some people, Rich Rogers. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I love problem solving where the players can just kind of chew on the idea and take different routes. And I don't know. I don't set up a solution. We just play to see what happens, play to see how they f figure it out. And this game was. It was so good. I used a, an introductory scenario from a thing called Code and Dagger. The designer Chad Walker has put out two free long supplements that have introductory scenarios and new powers and things like that. The second one was written in cooperation with Mozilla to try to teach information security. And it has a scenario where you wake up in a prison and it shows you all the things you kind of need to do. You have to figure out the problems and, and sets up the basics. And then we went from that to a much more open-ended okay, you need to, to figure out a way to put these two crime families, how to start a war between them. And that was three sessions of them doing information mapping and social engineering and all of that. And it was, it was great. I just, I, I dig it so much. Now, I, I will say the game doesn't have the most intuitive mechanics. It's got a unique system that takes a bit to get used to. Once you do, you can grok it pretty well. But, but it, it, do, it did take me a while to, to get what was happening in it. It does need a group who like puzzles and like working through big open-ended things and kind of being a little more directionless. Like you have an objective, but I'm not going to give you any other signposts to it. And so those are the two big things. It also has built into the setting this idea of there's a big adversary that is hunting you and eventually they're going to win. You build up uh, risk, which is kind of like heat for your group. And eventually it, you'll just fall. I mean, the, the, these bad guys will eventually catch up with you. You can only be a revolutionary self for so long before the, the big bad destroys you. Though in one of the supplements, he has some flipping of that. Like he had some ideas for how you might do it without that. So that's, that's good. Uh, Sherry, you, you played in it. So what would you say is important else about this? One, the text itself is supremely well written. It is got everything that you need when you need it. Like 
things come up when you need to know them, and then they go away until you need to know more about them. It is perhaps the best game text I've read, like start to finish, with things where I want them to be. The other thing is, is that the world that they build is super easy to fall into because it's built on some very simple concepts. The dwarves are IT culture. The elves are corporatists. Governments are governments. And the rest are a bunch of sheep that, you know, are just trying to make it through. And that's kind of how that's the world. And it's so easy. You completely understand what's going on. And then all of the magic that you have is based on these simple, you know, those infosec ideas where there's encryption, there's blocking and things like that, but it's all about information. So it's very clever. It's everything concentrates on that magic then because they've made the world really quite intuitive to understand. And you, you pretty much, you know who the immediate problems are, who has what assets, those kinds of things. It is a really good design. I think that it was an easy to drop into world anyway. It doesn't have a whole bunch of stuff with crazy elf names and, and insane meta history. And, you know, back in 300 years ago, this happened. There's not that kind of thing. So thank goodness. It's a world that you drop into and you do some stuff and it makes sense that you're doing it. And it's And there's a reason to do it. I loved that it gave us tools to do all the caper things that we needed. I loved that having any kind of magic wasn't tied to your class or anything like that, that everyone had a little of something. If they chose to learn it, they could. That was awesome. And I'm just going to say it again. It was a great game text. Really well written. And it came out before Blades in the Dark and used some of the best ideas from Blades in the Dark. Yeah, it, it has downtime. It has crew advancements. It has the idea of heat. Yep. And so there's that sort of constant pressure, like Blades in the Dark ended up building in parallel. So we have a lot of those those things. I mean, they're not saying that one took up for the other, because they definitely didn't. But it's like that kind of really good sense of what a caper game should be. These are natural, intuitive ideas, and they both did those. Bethany, had you heard of Cryptomancer at all? I'd heard the title. That's <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it was... I had no idea what it was about. It was one of those ones that, that came out of the blue for me. It so. sounds very interesting, though. Now I'm going to have to look for it. Yeah, I think it's I think it's really dynamite. Uh, do you have any questions for us? I'm a little curious about the the mechanic for actually solving the puzzles. How do you like resolve that, I guess? So so like the, the problems are about how you get people's passcodes. And you've got some magics that you can use to get that. Or how you infiltrate a shard network, which means how do you get a hold of some, someone's shard without them knowing it? How do I okay. get the passphrases that work on the shard network? How do I figure out, you know, who all is on it? And uh, that's all related to sort of the, the general... It's all social engineering. Yeah. And it's not like you absolutely and have to just focus fun. in on that side, but th those are tools that you use to, to deal with things. I think it's the most capery feeling of a caper games that we had because the social engineering is so effective. I mean, it's like the most effective way to get all that information. And so you really do have that nice. thing where you're running con games and you're trying to figure out how you could convince someone to just let you in far enough to get this one little bit that you need. Patrick used a glitter bomb to uh, uh, <laughs> prove that someone was having an affair with another person. Okay. It, was, it was classic bits like that. So all social engineering. And any game with a glitter bomb is is aces in my book. So, <laughs> uh, Chad Walker's doing a second edition of it uh, with the timeline moved uh, up, and that should be coming out in 2020. So I'm really looking forward to that. Hi, listeners. I want to tell you about the Gauntlet Patreon. The Gauntlet is one of the most active, vibrant communities in tabletop role-playing games. We produce podcasts, the Codex Zine, Gauntlet Hangouts, Gauntlet Con, and more. If you love small press, independent tabletop role-playing games, the Gauntlet is for you. And you can help keep things going by pledging to our Patreon. This year, we have four different pledge levels for you to join at, each of which comes with a number of benefits. At the $2 level, you get early access to our actual play podcasts, including Pocket Size Play, as well as a special Keeper of the Gauntlet title. At the $5 level, you also get a PDF of our monthly zine, Codex. Your name and Keeper of the Gauntlet title is listed in the back of each issue of Codex while your pledge is active. 
At the $6 level, you also get access to the Gauntlet Slack group, which is the heart of our community. And at the $8 level, you get early RSVP access to new game events on Gauntlet Hangouts. The $8 spots are limited based off how many early access players we think the Gauntlet Hangouts calendar can support. Every month on the 15th, we will make a small number of new $8 spots available. So if you want to play games with the Gauntlet, make sure you keep an eye on our Patreon page around that time so you can grab one of those rare spots. Finally, every member of the Gauntlet Patreon, no matter the level they pledge at, gets to attend GauntletCon each year for free. GauntletCon is our incredible online gaming convention, with over 200 game events and panels, competitions and prizes, and our bumpin' GauntletCon Discord server. Folks, we can't do all this awesome stuff without you, so go check out our page and please consider pledging. We're at patreon.com forward slash gauntlet. Thanks. So let's move on to our guest segment. Uh, in our guest segment, we have our guest, in this case, Bethany, discuss a project they're working on or upcoming game they're excited about or even request for the calendar. So, Bethany, what do you want to talk about today? Yeah, I'm playtesting, uh, I guess it's a mystery module for Dungeon World. It's originally actually for D&D 5th edition, and I've just converted it to Dungeon World, and it'll eventually be uh, system agnostic or multi-system. Okay. The playtest is going pretty well. It's having fun. It's, everyone's having a lot of fun with it, so... I'm happy about that. And what what's the premise? It's set in this creepy, depressing little mountain town where the PCs are stranded because of a freak blizzard that's cut off the passes on both sides. And while they're there, they kind of start getting glimpses of some maybe multiple uh, these dark, you know, sinister plots going on just below the surface of the town. Like, everyone kind of knows there's something going on at the factory, but nobody really knows what. There are bandits hiding in the sewers who occasionally attack people, and nobody really knows why. And the sheriff, for some reason, hasn't gone down there to investigate. So it's it, it's almost got, like, a, I think a southern gothic feel with these kind of entangled family secrets you could definitely lean into this it might have a little bit of a like weird small town i'm thinking something like hot fuzz okay where there's this big secret that everybody or at least a lot of people are in on there aren't so many people in on this but it's it's got a little bit of that feel to it i think uh sherry's gonna 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 cringe now when i say would you call it faulkner-esque like the that that kind of um not really. Oh. You could definitely, like, you can only make it that way if you want it. Okay. Um, I'm actually trying to sort of... <laughs> Sher- <laughs> Sherry hates Falconer, so I have, that's why I'm saying that. Yeah. <laughs> that's... Um, I'm actually trying to, like, have, a, have a, a tone to it, but also maybe introduce a lot of different options. Mm-hmm. You know, there are definitely no hor- horror elements. There's a lot of undead. The sewers are full of ghouls and zombies. There's a ghost who's, like an integral part of the plot but also you know the the ghost part of the story and the the ultimate you know kind of answer to the mystery you could you could go for more pathos with that it could be because it, it's sad but it's also scary and you could uh, lean into one or the other of that there's also a little bit of humor here and there and uh, that's actually what my players have really latched onto. oh really which was not what i was expecting and it's it's actually really interesting to see how people are approaching it from let's find all the funny things in this because there isn't a lot that I deliberately put in there that's funny you know there's maybe a little bit of tongue-in-cheek humor here and there the uh, the factory makes magical gadgets that are kind of a little bit uh, I think enchanted George Foreman grills and thigh masters uh, yeah so like that's that's really you know there, there's a few little tongue-in-cheek things but it's not really meant to be a humorous module and yet, uh, it seems to be playing as one right now. So that's kind of cool that I've, you know, to see that's in there. The other thing that I sort of only kind of intended to put a little bit of in and that finding a lot in is just like this family theme. Mm-hmm. Because two of my players have estranged family members and that's like a big part of their backstory. I kind of, I was looking for ways to tie that in and I'm finding all this stuff about parenthood and 
how far people will go to protect their children and uh, duty to family versus duty to the greater good of the community. And uh, yeah, it just, it keeps coming up. I'm like, oh, uh, way to go, subconscious, nice use of recurring themes. I didn't know I was doing it, but I'm happy to see it. So you did this originally as, as sort of a, a, a like a, a D&D model, you said? Mm-hmm. So let me ask you this. When you moved from, from that or or when you, you went just in general, when you started to think about it in terms of Dungeon World, Dungeon World has a very different set of explicit tools for getting information. How do you find that works in, in interaction with a mystery? A lot faster. <laughs> I expected the combat to go a lot faster, and that's the one reason I wanted to move it to Dungeon World, because there is combat. Uh, you can get away with doing very little combat, or you can do a lot. The problems with having it as a and d module were that if you avoided combat, there was no reward for that. In fact, there was a punishment for that because you never leveled up. Oh. And then like in the final bit where you pretty much have to fight, you're level one. When I ran it, I just had to be, give very generous milestone XP. Where Dungeon World, you can you would level up a lot faster without combat. And the other is that just combat is so slow mm-hmm. in D&D, even 5th edition. And for a module that isn't about combat, it took up just a really disproportionate amount of the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've been playing, we play 13th Age as a kind of a uh, one-off, and, and even that, which is pretty fast, is still... Okay, we're still in the yeah. combat, apparently. Um, the other thing is I, I got away from having like set places. The The original version was very, very location-based. Like, you go this place, these people are there, you find these clues. Uh, with Dungeon World, I found myself, when someone, you know, rolls a 10 on Discern Realities, just giving them a clue that um, normally, like, I would have waited for them to go to the right place for. It's like, oh, well, you know what? This can be here. It's good. <laughs> Yeah. It's really empowering in some ways. Yeah. To, you know, you're going to get yeah, the stuff. I, um, don't have to wait for them to ask the right questions, which is nice. I guess I didn't have to in, in fifth edition. I did. And it was a bad choice that mm-hmm. I'm glad that Dungeon World sort of encourages you to not do that because sooner or later, a player is going to make a really good role on the certain realities and you're going to have to answer their questions and you're going to have, you know, you have this information to feed them, so you might as well do it right now. Sherry, questions? So would you redesign, I mean, are you going to redesign it so that it works like laid out for the Dungeon World format then? Yeah, right now it is. Like I said, I want to make it system agnostic. What I might end up doing is have two different versions of it. Hmm. The you know, Dungeon World version and like an OSR version. Yeah. Because I, it, the organization, I don't know how well I can make that just one version that's just... The all-purpose one. Mm-hmm. Oh boy, all that information theory for that stuff—that is going to be a fun job. <laughs> yeah, I have a you know chart of like different different entry points and different like clue trails that will lead to you know where they'll lead and how. I want to I want to basically have a lot of different entry points that will appeal to different players mm-hmm. that they can jump onto and that will eventually lead them to the same place. Awesome. Cool. Uh, anything else you want to say about that? I don't think so. I, I actually, there is a play test of it on the Gauntlet cal- calendar for May. Awesome. That'll be either the third or fourth play test, depending on whether I get another one in, in April. So hopefully I will have the, the kinks ironed out of it by then. Awesome. I'm so glad you're doing that. All right. It's giving me life. Sherry, this month, what is giving you life? So I'm going to say this, and it's not a commercial, but there's a a tea. It's called Peromi brand, and it's Earl Grey. It is a lovely Earl Grey tea. Uh, The bergamot is particularly aromatic, and it gives the tea an almost sweet flavor to it. But the reason I'm talking about it giving me life is not because of the beautiful nature of this tea, but that it comes in sachets that require I have to make a whole pot of it. And that means that I save it for times when I have another person that's going to drink it with me. And lately that time has been when I go and spend time with my mother on Thursday afternoons. Um, She's in late stages of dementia. So it is lovely to spend time with her, have tea, and have something that no matter how confused she gets, she still recognizes it. It is so, I guess, life-giving to hear her 
even in the midst of her confusion, take a sip of that tea and go, oh, Earl Grey. (laughs) I just, I love it so much because you just don't know at any time what she's got, what she has access to. And some apparently Earl Grey tea is really deep knowledge that's down there. And so that this week has been giving me life. That's Wow. It's nice how a small thing like that can just magnify so much. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Bethany, what, what is giving you life? <laughs> I wrote down here, the sun. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I, and, and it's perfect because today is the day that, you know, that we switch over to daylight savings time. But even before that, the, the days are getting longer and there are whole hours of daylight when I get home from work. And I am embarrassingly affected by, uh, you know, season change. I mm-hmm. I don't live in Canada or you know Scandinavia. I live in North Carolina, so this shouldn't be a big deal, but somehow it is. And I just um, I'm really looking forward to spring and longer days. Yeah, we're on the far edge of the Eastern time zone, so people I know who've been from the coast who came to visit us, they're like, "Why is it still dark?" Yeah, yeah. So it's because it's still. Ugh, I, I I look forward to that immensely. Uh, last thing, what is giving me life, I'm going to mention a, a little show that's on Netflix called uh, Flavorful Origins uh, Chausson. I'm probably saying that terribly wrong. These are like little 15-minute episodes on different ingredients in Chinese cooking in the Chaoshan region, and they're weird. They, they talk about they, – they, a lot of them are very strange and very alien forms of cooking and very alien ingredients and things like that and it's really cool and if you're interested in food as an element for a fantasy game going and looking at a culture's wildly different preparations and what they actually consume i think is a tremendous resource and this this show is easy no pun intended bite-sized chunks uh that uh you can watch and, and pick some things things up from is it in Chinese or English? Or? Uh, it is in Chinese with English subtitles. Okay. Subtitles are perhaps not the greatest. You can tell that they use some words. Uh, f- they use the word fresh or refreshing over and over again. <laughs> when I don't think that's what exactly what they mean. Sometimes it means juicy. Sometimes it means like sharp or bright fl- flavored. And, and other times yeah. I have no idea what they're talking oh, about. So it's like it's reading a, an Amazon product description of these ingredients. Yes. <laughs> that no one ever hires a decent <laughs> translator for. Right through the machine. Listeners, that's our show. If you'd like to get in touch with us on Twitter, it's at gauntlet rpg we have a website you can check out gauntlet-rpg.com we are also on patreon at patreon.com forward slash gauntlet uh, you can go there if you want to support the show uh we we do have a, a some tiers there that include the a zine access there's there's lots of great stuff there if you don't want to do that please consider rating and or reviewing us on your podcast app slash catcher of choice uh, that really helps us to actually get attention and rise up uh, through those little ratings. Uh, Bethany, thank you for being on the program. Uh, you're welcome. I'm very happy to be here. I think this is really cool. And Sherry, thank you. Oh, sure. Anytime. And listeners, that's our show. Stop.